So welcome everyone to this uh, new Pathways Forum. I see uh, some familiar names and faces, and it's good to see you again. And a warm welcome to those who are attending the Pathways Forum for the first time. I'm Gilles Marcignac. I'm a member of the Future Earth Secretariat, and I am coordinating the, the Pathways Initiative. If you have already attended other forums, uh, you already know this, but the, the Pathways Forum is really aiming to provide a, a space to collectively reflect on concepts and theories of change uh, and discuss the practical implications of sustainability science and transdisciplinarity for research practices. And part of the idea behind this collective space is also that you, as part of uh, the Pathways community, uh, get to shape what is happening here. And following the first two forums, several of uh, you have expressed the desire to hear about concrete case studies on transdisciplinary uh, pathways-oriented research. Well, today, we are fortunate to have with us two researchers uh, who will do exactly that. Uh, Alice McClure and Timila de Cezan led research uh, as part of the LIRA program, uh, which is a program designed to foster integrated solutions-oriented research on complex sustainability challenges in African cities. And we're very uh, fortunate to have uh, them with us today. To give you a brief overview of how this session will be organized, uh, first, we will have a bit of context um, from um, Florina Schneider, um, who is the scientific director of the Institute for Social Ecological Research, and uh, who had a bit of a role uh, in the in the LIRA program. So she'll be able to tell us more about um, how the program emerged and what were the, the goals uh, for that program. Then we will have Alice and Timila they give presentations on their projects. And each presentation will be followed by roughly 15 minutes for questions. And then following both presentations, uh, we will engage in a discussion involving everyone. So with this, uh, I give the floor to Florina for a brief introduction of the LIRA program. Florina, whenever you're ready. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, have the chance to present the LIRA program to you. Um, can you see my screen? Is it properly shared? OK, well. So I'm uh, talking here, uh, uh, replacing Katja Palva would be the, the coordinator of the LIRA program, but she unfortunately cannot be here today. So I, I will um, present it because I was involved as, a, in, as part of a learning study we conducted with uh, all the, the grantees of this program to learn more about how pathways oriented research, transdisciplinary research can be implemented and conducted in diverse African contexts. So the LIRA program is a program, as Shil just said, its aim is to increase the production of high quality integrated inter and transdisciplinary solutions oriented research on global sustainability by early career scientists in Africa. So it's one of the only program I think that really focuses on Africa, on transdisciplinary research and on early career scientists. So this is really a particular. And so the second goal is also really to build a new generation of scientists with the ability and capacity to produce this type of knowledge. So this means the program uh, uh, large research funding program run by the International Science Council together with its regional office for Africa and partnerships with NASAC, that this pro program not only provided grants for um, researchers to conduct research, but also organized uh, um, very diverse uh, training and exchange activities and also um, cross-country collaborations. So LIRA started in 2015 and since then funded about 28 projects, each for uh, two years, 
And each of these uh, projects took place in at least two African countries. The overall thematic focus of the LIRA program is on TDR pathways to sustainability in urban context in Africa. And there were three uh, thematic calls. The first on understanding the energy health and health natural disasters nexus. The second on advancing the sustainable development, development goal 11. So this is on urban development. And the third one on pathways towards sustainable African urban development. We have uh, now two grantees here presenting their work. Alice uh, was part of the second cohort, so on the SDG 11, and uh, Temilade was part of the third cohort regarding the pathways to urban development. And with this, I give back, not sure if to Shil or directly. I'll take, it. The... I'll take it, Florina, thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much for this for this introduction to the to the Lira program, which I think situates uh, what uh, Alice and Timelade will be presenting uh, a bit better. So, <clears throat> our first speaker uh, is Alice McClure. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's really exciting. I have um, seen the the first two sessions, and I think it's a really valuable platform to be involved in. Uh, my name is Alice McClure, as Gila and Florina have, have said, I'm from the University of Cape Town within a research group called the Climate System Analysis Group. So primarily climate scientists, but I'm one of the few social scientists working with these climate scientists interested in social or human dimensions and climate risk and resilience. And over the years, I've built a passion for transdisciplinary research and particularly the learning that happens in these spaces with a bunch of, of people from a variety of different backgrounds. And I think what's really great about today's session, as, as Florina has said, is that it's bringing some of the early career researcher and African um, work into this, into this space. And I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, so I think I'll get started then with the content of my presentation. Before I do, I wanted to just share some acknowledgements. Um, this, is, this was very much a transdisciplinary project, and we worked closely with Etequini Municipality, which is in Durban in South Africa, and with the city of Harare in, um, in Harare in Zimbabwe, and also closely alongside local communities, civil society organizations, uh, residents associations, and, and community-based organizations. And then I, I don't, I'm not sure if any of them have joined us today, but I had a fantastic team um, within which I worked from the University of Cape Town, from Chinoy University of Technology, and then from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So I would just like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues. So before I, I, I speak a little bit more about the project and how it took place um, and what, we, what we've learned from it, I wanted to just ground uh, this presentation in a particular concept that was important for us, and that is this idea of transformative adaptation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it over the next couple of minutes. But I know that not everybody in this space, even though it, the, this forum brings together everybody working in the pathways realm, it doesn't, it not, necess, not, not everybody is necessarily has an understanding of climate change and the climate angle. So this idea of transformative adaptation is, is, is about changing the fundamental attributes of a system in order to adapt to climate change. Um, or climate variability, and so it really looks at tackling the root causes of vulnerability, for example, inequality, and questions assumptions about power, interests, and identity. So we're going to, as I said, we're going to explore this a little bit more over the next couple of minutes, but I wanted to put this key concept up front um, to frame our, our conversation over the next little while. So in, in light of this, um, the, the project in which I was involved particularly aimed to better understand the pathways to transformative adaptation in Southern African cities as a response to climate change that supports the implementation of SDGs. And some key questions that guided this was, what does transformative adaptation look like in Southern African cities? Are there potentially transformative interventions um, in Durban and Harare? And what do the pathways of these interventions look like? And how might these interventions and also other interventions that work towards adaptation be more transformative in the future? So I wanted to give a, an overview of the project and I suppose with a little bit of a, of a pathways framing or a pathways thinking. 
and and I wanted to show you how how it sort of played out over time. So the blue bubbles in the graphic that you can see are engagements that took place, transdisciplinary engagements in both Durban and Harare. And then the gray bubbles are research processes. Um, and then the yellow items are some of the, the outputs. Um, so we had several engagements in both Durban and Harare. It was a little bit more challenging to implement some of the engagement engagements in Harare um, because of the situation at the time. So we had to adapt um, to what could be done at that time. Uh, so we started off initially in by familiarizing ourselves with transformative adaptation and with the theoretical uh, aspects of transformative adaptation. So what does transformative adaptation mean? What does it mean in a Southern African city context? Um, and, and what does it mean? Um, so the, the, the sort of recent thinking about, about transformative adaptation in these local contexts. And so we took this, this understanding with us into the first learning lab, which was the transdisciplinary space in which we worked. And we co-defined characteristics with stakeholders in cities of transformative adaptation. So we asked them, what does, with this understanding, what does transformative adaptation mean to you from your practical experience? Um, and so we, we put together these, these, these characteristics of transformative adaptation that were specific to, the, to, to Southern African cities or to these two Southern African cities. And we also co-selected case studies with participants. So we asked them, now that we've defined these characteristics of transformative adaptation, can you identify um, any interventions that are taking place in Durban or Harare that are potentially transformative or that are working their way towards being quite transformative according to these characteristics? We then, um, we then undertook interviews with people who've been involved in these interventions to explore these characteristics. So um, we used the, these characteristics as a transdisciplinary framework to understand the, the, the processes and mechanisms towards becoming more transformative. And we also then in the second learning lab, we, um, we looked, we took the broader the stakeholders together again, and we looked backwards and forwards. And we said, so how, how is it that we've reached these points of being relatively transformative within these interventions and also importantly where are these interventions going towards is are all the interventions working towards one sort of common objective um, in each of the cities how do all of the projects uh, um, connect up to one another to be able to reach this common goal we then um, in the fourth learning lab which was the final learning lab we shared findings of what we had um, findings from the research and we also thought about what next so what does it mean for these interventions and other interventions into the future and we use the data from both the, the interviews and the learning labs to better understand the pathways towards more transformative um, responses to climate change in these particular contexts so just that you so that you know um, what the, the the framework looked like that we were working with when we were interrogating or analyze, analyzing these interventions that were potentially transformative. The co-developed characteristics that came up based on these transdisciplinary engagements were firstly around fundamental or sustainable changes in thinking and doing. And there were uh, sort of sub characteristics related to the interventions developing capacity for those involved to support these fundamental changes. Also an idea that these fundamental changes must be permanent or sustained. Um, the second characteristics were, were around being inclusive. And again, a, a sub-characteristic around challenging power, sorry, relationships across stakeholder groups supporting this, this inclusivity. The third set, uh, characteristic was around challenging power asymmetries. The fourth was around um, these interventions being de demonstrable in practice. So they need to be some tangible benefits for the beneficiaries that are noticed. The fourth was around being, um, the fifth, sorry, was around being responsive and flexible. And then the sixth was around holistic complex system thinking. And again, sub-characteristics um, for, for this characteristic were that the interventions addressed climate in combination with other things, and they, they break down divisions between adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development. So as I mentioned, these are the characteristics that we developed with the stakeholders in, in Durban and Harare, and they, this became our transdisciplinary framework for identifying and assessing interventions during the course of the project. So I want to share some of the outcomes from the intervention according to a, a particular framework that I find quite useful in terms of transdisciplinary planning, but also assessing outcomes from transdisciplinary work. And that is the outcome spaces framework that was presented by Mitchell et al. a few years ago, but very relevant. 
and they talk about change um, from transdisciplinary interventions in several different spheres. So the first sphere that they speak about is the change in the situation. So what are the, the tangible and noticeable changes on the ground from these interventions? And in our case, we saw strong relationships. I mean, this is something that is not uncommon for transdisciplinary work, but strong relationships in Durban and Harare, particularly between the university and the local partners. And I think what's important about this is that these relationships continue to this day. And the, 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 the work, um, a lot of the work that was undertaken in this project uh, has been carried forward through other processes um, in both Durban and Harare. Also in Durban, these characteristics that we co-defined became principles um, within the local context. And these principles were integrated into ongoing work in Durban. So in both Durban and Harare, we looked at interventions that um, aim to deal with climate risk uh, through management of the e ecosystems. And, um, and so there's something in Durban called the Transformative River Management Program that is looking at uh, upscaling some of these smaller interventions across the whole landscape of Durban to deal with flood risk while creating jobs uh, connected to the green economy. And that the principles that were co-developed in, in the Lara project have been integrated into that work of the Transformative River Management Program, which is currently in design. And then in Harare, uh, there has been attribution of this Lara project supporting a specific climate change desk in Harare, in the local municipality. And, um, uh, they, I also heard from colleagues that this idea of bringing communities in, in, into the, the management of ecosystems to reduce climate risk has been, um, has because of the learning between Durban and Harare, has been integrated into the budgeting of the, the Harare um, finance as well. And then also just more from a programmatic perspective, I think the, the change in the situation from the Lira, what I, what I saw were sort of new networks of young TD experts and better, more, more collaborative researchers, I think, from, um, from being involved in this program. The third outcome space that uh, Mitchell et al. present is this idea of stocks and flows of knowledge. So what are the, what are the, the, the flows, of the, the stocks of knowledge that are produced from the work and, and the new flows um, for this knowledge? And so it uh, seems obvious, but um, the knowledge for researchers and societal stakeholders on transformative adaptation, but specifically in the, the South African city context, and then the new channels of communication because of the new relationships that have been developed, um, which were particularly exciting. And then a couple of other outputs. I think one of the most exciting outputs from the work was the, the a documentary that we produced, and I can, I'm happy to share the link for this on transformative river management um, in Durban. And this was shared at the launch of the Durban Adaptation Plan on the 3rd of September in 2020. And this was, I think, one of the key motivating um, pieces of knowledge that helped the Harari, the, the, the stakeholders in Harare understand what was going on in Durban and aim to bring some of that into the work that they were doing in Harare. And then the third outcome space and um, I must mention that this is quite a simplistic pr uh, presentation of these outcome spaces. There's obviously interlinkages between these outcome spaces and also um, with the project uh, being located in a bigger a landscape of ongoing processes of change. But the third um, area of change that, they that, that Mitchell et al. presented, this idea of mutual and transformative learning, which is not new for um, transdisciplinary work, but in our context again, aha moments across participants of the complexity of the issues that they were dealing with, that there are multiple drivers of risk and multiple benefits from interventions, and that actually people are working towards similar goals across these different interventions in these landscapes. I think the new longitudinal perspectives of the interventions were particularly useful for the stakeholders. So looking back and seeing where they had come from in these interventions and thinking about where they were going into the future. And then, uh, yeah, there was a lot of opportunity for seeing some of the risks firsthand on site visits and understanding perspectives of other people better um, in the landscapes. So I think this is the, the heart of what we are talking about today is the influence of the pathways approach on the work that we undertook and how we brought it and sort of concretized it in the work that we did. And I want to I want to present the influence of the pathways approach according to three uh, broad categories because I think it did it really did um, resonate uh, throughout our work. The first is the the conceptual. So from the very beginning, um, we aim to mix together these ideas of adaptation pathways and transformative pathways. 
So if I borrow from uh, Werner's et al, who have recently uh, published an article on climate resilient development pathways, but they look broadly at different types of pathways in the climate realm. They, they, they present adaptation pathways as sequences of actions that can be implemented progressively towards an adaptation goal. So that's a, a particular kind of pathway. And then tran transform transformative pathways are more sort of a metaphor for broad directions of change that represent different strategic aims. So we, we aim to bring these two together by understanding pathways towards transformative adaptation in the Southern African city contexts. Um, and then also the sort of longitudinal perspective. So the longitudinal perspective from the very beginning uh, influenced how we undertook the work. From a methodological perspective, I think the learning labs and transdisciplinarity in general, they were very open-ended iterative learning spaces in third spaces. So we aim, aim to bring people outside of their home spaces into a neutral space um, to negotiate and to discuss with one another. And the outcomes are really not predefined beforehand, but, but um, the, the design of each lab was based on the outcomes of the lab before. And there was a lot of room for experimentation and iteration and a lot of exercises for looking backwards and for looking forward. So methodologically, I think the pathways thinking was rooted into everything that we did. And then analytically, and I think this is where it got very challenging and also quite interesting is that we aim to understand, so we aim to understand the changes over time of these interventions. And we aim to un and to really unpack the moments of change towards transformation in these interventions. So we looked at antecedent pathways, pathways leading up to a particular point in time of several interventions. And we used all the data from the learning labs, from interviews to develop narratives or stories for these projects over time. And then we applied a, a framework, which is, is called as governance configurations to analyze these major changes, as I've, men as I've mentioned, along these pathways. And for those who are not familiar with governance configurations, it's, it's basically an ensemble of social and material structures which are intimately entangled at a particular time and place. And these result in a particular sets of set of decisions, interventions, and outcomes. So we use this framework to understand or to try and analyze the changes uh, towards more transformative um, interventions. And so we looked at six dimensions of governance configurations. And we deconstructed the narratives into these dimensions, and then we look for relations and meaning across these different um, dimensions. Um, I just wanted to show very briefly a mix of some of the exercises that we undertook at the bottom left-hand corner. You can see a colleague who has um, sharing some of the results of some of the, the, the backwards-looking exercises, which was um, an exercise called the river of life which we've used in several different in several different um, instances it's a really wonderful exercise where you basically use the metaphor of a river to think about how things have um, grown or changed flown in different di in different directions over time and so each of these interventions drew their river of life from source to sea um, and then we analyze these and then in the top right hand corner you can see some of the sort of collective thinking towards a transformative landscape. So um, trying to understand where all of the different interventions are moving towards into the future and whether there's overlap between the between these different um, goals, which we did see there was a lot of overlap between what they aim to achieve. So I, I'm not going to go into this um, because I, th I think I'm running a bit short on time, but I just this is a, this is a, a narrative of Durban's transformed landscape that all of the stakeholders agreed on. At, um, so we, 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 we built this together, the, the stakeholders across different interventions and from different groups of, of, um, of stakeholders. And then we revisited this again in one of the learning labs and made sure that everybody agreed that kind of, this was the transformed landscape that everybody was working towards. And it's a very ideologic, ideological future, um, but it helps to clarify the change towards which people were working. And I think they found it quite useful to, to come towards this common objective. And again, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, based on this, this when we were doing the forward-looking exercise and based on this um, Durban transformed landscapes, we identified pathways towards this landscape and also um, tried to identify current activities that really help towards these pathways and looked at various realms within these pathways. So within the so in society, economy, governance, nature, and technology. And you can see some of the red, um, the red text is some of the interventions that are already ongoing. And this is just a snapshot. There was a lot more behind this work, but this is some of the knowledge that was co-developed um, with societal stakeholders during the learning lab. So um, we were asked to reflect specifically on dealing with some of the temporal disconnects using the pathways approach, which I think is a very 
a real challenge and there's obviously many reasons for these disconnects i think in the context of climate change we're dealing with climate uncertainty along with many other different types of uncertainty there's obviously the policy and planning disconnects so how does what people are doing now and planning now contribute to the future and then there's um, also this movement of champions so if you have or, or, or um, entrepreneurs so if you have somebody who is really pushing forward an agenda um, particularly in the southern african city context and probably many others that person is often uh, moved to another department or to another location and so how do you how do you uh, maintain this momentum um, over time towards an objective in, into the future and i think these are just three of some of the challenges in terms of dealing with temporal disconnects and I don't have a, a yeah, I don't have a an answer that I think um, is a, is a clear solution. But again, from the from the Venice et al. paper that I mentioned earlier, that brings together a lot a lot of the adaptation pathways thinking in in the climate realm. They speak about meeting short term and long term adaptation needs by targeting a specific uh, decision or decision making, and then sequencing actions considering future uncertainty. And I think. Particularly this first um, this first point about targeting a specific decision or decision maker. In our context, it was building relationships, and I think all transdisciplinary contexts with societal stakeholders, and actually seeing these relationships carry forward over time into, even though they they smaller projects, they, the the overarching objective is being worked towards um, over time beyond the lifespan of these projects. And another really interesting point is that Durban has been on its adaptation journey for a very long time. I think relatively speaking actually internationally and they have been very good at documenting their learning journey or their learning pathway and so it's it's really great to see the all these small activities or interventions over time that have added up to something which is quite substantial in terms of the of, of adaptation sorry i know i'm running over time i hope i can give one more minute for for major findings and reflections so in terms of our major findings, according to our analyses using these um, the, the pathways thinking and, and um, the governance configuration, I just I wanted to touch on three points and we could talk about this for a very long time, but but the three the the note were the the noteworthy uh, findings that we um, came up with was that material reality really matters and it seems like an obvious um, finding, but the specific physical landscape in which the case studies were evol have evolved really influenced how the actors related to water and associated climate risks and how they also formulated solutions. As I said, it seems like an obvious finding, but it really has implications for ideas of designing work and scaling work into the future. Um, also, this idea of shifting relations, so the discourses and practices that were um, that were noted in Durban and Harare suggested shifts in relations between built infrastructure and ecosystems with regards to water management in the cities and nature and people played a much more prominent role in the potentially transformative interventions in both Durban and in Harare. And then the last point again, there's a lot in here, but just around agency integration and institutionalization. So agency of local actors um, was a very important factor in, in driving forward these transformative interventions, but there were different types of local actors, interestingly, in, in different interventions and in different cities, and there's reasons for this as well. Um, but then also the, um, the nature of their approaches is strongly influenced by their ability to call on other actors vertically and horizontally, and the institutional groundwork that has been done in terms of integrating climate change thinking into, the, into ongoing work. And then just, just some short reflections is that I think what we what we noted in Durban and Harare align well with these ideas of multi-stakeholder oriented pathways and transformation oriented pathways. So stressing the social and institutional components of pathways and acknowledging that lots of people need to be brought together into a setting to flesh these out. Um, and really emphasizing this idea of conflicting goals and interests and contested values. Um, and also, yeah, thinking about the fact that the, uh, the current system and the performance of the current system or the current pathways is probably not good enough and needs to be shifted towards something or transformed towards something else. And so we see these pathways as messy, ongoing learning processes. And something else that is sort of a passion of mine or something that I, I think, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's deeper than my heart is that I, I feel like there's still not, a, not enough focus on the past when we think about pathways into the future. Um, and we did a lot of work on these antecedent pathways, but I feel like the, uh, or, or, or 
the contradictions and the tensions um, that are implicit or that are sit within our history um, really are going to dealing with these surfacing these um, and dealing with them are really going to drive forth the the change or the transformation that we need and there's a whole body of of, of work on that or, or literature on that related to change um, systems change but I feel like if, if we're going to do justice to the pathways thinking then we really need to be dealing with the past and the the, the contradictions and tensions that sit within our systems and there are many of those in the South African city context and everywhere else as well I think that is it from me so sorry for going over time Thank you very much, Alice, for this really interesting presentation. I would like now to invite questions from, from everyone. And I see that we already have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. So I'll start with one question from the chat about um, the experiential inputs uh, into the uh, antecedent pathways. Uh, so kind of like the past aspect of um, developing pathways, particularly pertaining to the river of life discussion. How was this uh, validated or enriched with facts or data? And of course, that's a, kind of a, a central uh, question, the critical question when it comes to transdisciplinary research, how much time does this take? Thank you for the question. Um, I think I understood it correctly. So the, yeah, the, the river of life exercise was um, a fantastic exercise to bring together different people to discuss these antecedent pathways or part of these antecedent pathways. But as has been mentioned, um, the, the, the information that was shared needs to be triangulated or validated according to other sources of information. So we spent a lot of time as a research team undertaking interviews with different people who have been involved in the different interventions, um, qualitative um, interviews, uh, semi-structured interviews. And so this also formed uh, uh, a lot of the data that we used, a ba basis for understanding where the projects have come from. And then obviously the, the project documentation itself as well. There was, there's a, a lot of um, gray literature that we were able to um, collect from, from the people that we interviewed on the different interventions. Um, and we used this alongside the, the lab reports and the, the river of life outputs and the interviews to understand the, the antecedent pathways. Of the different interventions. Thank you, Alice. Yeah, I'm Dr. Renuka Thakur from University College of Estate Management, UK Reading. Uh, and I'm also founder of Global Sustainable Futures Progressive Partnership Network. I have already put down some posts about my network if anyone wants to join. However, the question for you was uh, like, we generally find some resistance from mm -hmm or barriers for the stakeholders to engage initially. So what were their big, what are the common barriers and how did you overcome these barriers for the stakeholder engagement? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I'm afraid I'm gonna share an answer that is a bit, maybe a bit of a cheat answer because um, I have been involved in another project called the Future Resilience of African Cities and Lands Project, which has been ongoing since 2015 or 2016. And we ha had we were able to build strong relationships with a lot of the societal stakeholders through that through that initial project, and so for the Lyra project, which was a much shorter time frame, we could call on those existing relationships um, and bring people together in the room, and also the the relationship between the university in Harare and the university in Durban really helped to with a lot of the different stakeholders um, in this in the city really helped to bring people into the same room. So particularly in Durban and UK, the University of KwaZulu Natal has been undertaking a lot of engaged research for a long time and working closely with communities and with the local municipality. And so there was that trust that was already built there. Um, and, and I think a lot of the work that they have been doing hasn't been extractive, you know, it's really been trying to make change on the ground. And so the, the partners that we brought or that were involved in this particular project really helped to um, to be able to bring stakeholders together based on that pre-existing trust and those pre-existing relationships. But there, there's always resistance um, when you when we do bring people together. And I think that um, you know, trying trying initially to build the first the first engagement was probably the, the most important um, engagement in, in setting the scene and really helping people to understand it as a co-owned process. So that we didn't really even sort of, yeah, the first half of the first learning lab, which is a full day 
was set, about setting the scene, about um, asking people, you know, what their rules of engagement were, what it was that they would like to discuss, how they would like to take some of the work forward. And so it was really trying to build that sort of um, co-owned process from the very beginning. Um, are you referring specifically to sort of to bringing people into the room and inviting them and, and not and, and people sort of refusing those invitations from the very beginning? As uh, yeah, I, actually, I was looking into uh, like trying to identify the motivations where you know uh, generally, as as you said, if we if we have established a relationship mm. or some sort of uh, opening is already there, then mm. it, it becomes very easy for us to go move or build on it. Mm. I'm specifically looking at our wider scenario of no one should be left mm. behind and how we can bring those minorities or mm. people who have no voice or how we can mm. bring those people to mm. bring into our, uh, uh, you know, stakeholder engagement forums. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's something that um, there's, there's something that we are going to reflect on a little bit later on in the session on power, the, the power dynamics in these processes, and I think um, linking to inclusivity and um, we, the methodology that we use, this learning labs methodology was also adopted from the Fractal project because it seemed to be a very effective methodology to bring people into the room, into this third space and outside of their home institutions. But on critical reflection of that methodology, um, you know, there's some clear indications about people who, who were left out of the room, particularly because of the language in which the the learning labs were implemented um, sort of the paradigm of learning and um, and how these activities are designed and implemented is very much within a western um, paradigm and so that is something that we have critically reflected on and i do think that there, it was a even though we had representation from civil society organizations it definitely wasn't strong enough you know it was those people who could speak english um, and those people who sort of could engage with some of the technical content so there's definitely a tension between um, um, yeah, between how we bring everybody into the same room, but maybe that's not, maybe it's not, maybe the next, you know, set of interventions is about bringing people together, but also many more focused and um, focused uh, dialogues that look completely different to a learning lab alongside that. Um, so we have, as I have critically reflected with colleagues and it definitely will uh, influence my practice going forward as a transdisciplinary researcher. Yes, thank you. I do find that uh, technology or even technology, because if, even people want to, uh, language is the main barrier, mm -hmm. but and if they know English and they do not have the facility to engage mm -hmm. on online forums or something, then also they are left out and so on. So yeah, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your uh, explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. I see that Zena has a question, but first I'm gonna take a question from Raki from the chat who's asking a, uh, quite a specific question about the context of your research. What was the time frame of the study? And when was the study conducted? Um, Raki would like to understand how the study helped uh, the people in uh, Durban during the floods of 2019. Mm. So the, the short answer is I don't think the study helped the people in Durban in the floods of 2019. I think that um, the, so the study was from 2018 to 2020 and a little bit into 2021. So because the study was a lot about um, co-producing knowledge to influence interventions, I don't think that there were any sort of concrete activities that were implemented from this study um, that helped the people in Durban um, during the floods of 2019. But the, you know, the, 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 these incremental change processes over time, I think a lot of the knowledge that was, um, that was generated or co-produced during, during the study is slowly being integrated into thinking and planning for, flood, for mitigating flood risk in Durban. And that's where it's sort of this broader perspective on, on adaptation or resilience that is trying to bring a more transformative perspective to it and um, plays out over time. And, and it's really interesting actually that the, 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 the stuff that is ongoing in Durban, the work that is ongoing in Durban is they're looking at trying to, they look, they're, they're looking at trying to scale up or um, design or implement interventions across the whole landscape of Durban to reduce flood risk while creating employment and job opportunities associated with the green economy. 
I think I mentioned this a little bit a little bit earlier in, in the work and or in the presentation, sorry. And so that's something like 7,000 um, kilometers of, of rivers that they're trying to understand how to um, how to scale up what we've what they've learned over the last couple of years across these different landscapes. And it's really complex because you know they have the public land, they've got private land, they've got um, traditional lands, um, Ingonyama Trust land, which it belongs to um, um, the local kingdom. And so it's really these sort of complex issues about uh, of, of trying to make change across the landscape, working with lots of different types of stakeholders. But sorry, that was a very roundabout way of saying that I think that the knowledge that was co-produced during that time will um, influence the, the, the way that people, um, the way that flood is mitigated in Durban um, and where the people engage in, in, in building resilience as well. Thanks. Zena, thank you for waiting. Go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And uh, I have put my questions down in the chat, but I just wanted this one specific one, which was uh, which was uh, coming from the 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 mapping out of the um, uh, interventions. Uh, according, you know, with respect to um, technology or policy action or stakeholder mm -hmm. capacities that you have mapped out, uh, mm -hmm. and some in the red you said had already begun. So I just wanted to understand where that during the stakeholder discussions were these prioritized and how, if at all, did you find uh, that there were some which would be almost like entry point or they and they lead to sequential. Uh, mm -hmm. actions and do they actually cause conflicts amongst themselves are there trade-offs between mm -hmm. one of those identified act activities and actions and interventions and the others so how does that get handled and this connects to the other point i had is that in as you move in this uh, you know in, initiate these uh, interventions where are the windows of opportunity within the policy uh, strategies, whether these are urban policy strategies at the at the city level or at the national level, that you are finding uh, uh, where the where the approaches can be up can be taken up and mm. mainstreamed. Thank you for that rich uh, set of questions. I'm going to try and do justice to them. I think I'm going to. So the the first one is around the 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 different interventions according to the mm -hmm. different themes. And whether they were um, how they were prioritized, and whether there were any trade offs associated with these, right? Um, yeah, I mean, probably again, we didn't, we probably didn't go into this in as much depth as we could have, because I, I think that the trade offs, you know, the synergies and trade offs across different interventions, as much is 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 a really important part of thinking about change pathways. So what we did do initially is we we identified these different themes. Um, and then we had groups who worked, who were, uh, um, who were, what's the right word, passionate about these different themes, and they and and they were involved in them somehow in the in the local context. And so they listed what was already ongoing, but then looking at the, the pathway, what they really believed should be implemented on top of these, and acknowledging that these um, these ongoing activities are, mm -hmm. you know, they, they highlighted those that they think potentially are not um, as, as influential as they could be. So really prioritizing the ones that should be um, supported over mm -hmm. time. Um, and then they, so those were, those were important and those were ongoing. And, and then there were a set that was, um, that was additional to those that they thought important to achieving the particular outcome. And then they shared this back within the group. And a lot of the, yeah, I guess a lot of the, the, the kind of trade-off and synergy happened in the dialogue. And then we finalized a set of, of priorities after a couple of hours of dialogue. And that has huge implications actually for who's in the room has huge implications for that, obviously. Um, and, and because these are social processes, uh, the people who are in the room um, influence the outcomes of that. Um, and, and, and then, yeah, so, th so there was a lot of, there was a lot of, um, the, uh, there was a lot of experiences of people with different ideas for things and, and how they should be implemented. But through the dialogue, they reached some consensus around around the the priority path of actions for pathways. I have my own bugbear around consensus as well because I'm not sure consensus is always the right way to do things. But um, it really helped for the sort of thinking about the future. Um, and then the second part of your question was about about the windows of opportunity. Yes. Yeah. So the windows of opportunity. So the, the, the project was somewhat designed with um, 
with the thinking about because it's only a two-year project and it was something that we spoke a lot about in the beginning when we had our Lara training at Florina I think was part of or maybe she wasn't part of the very first one but you know this is a two-year project and you expect some kind of change on the ground how how, how can this you know it's a very short amount of time to build relationships and then to notice change on the ground and so um, one of the strategies was really trying to tap into the into the ongoing planning processes um, and agendas in the cities at that time. And as I mentioned, there, there was this fractal project that, that I'd been a part of earlier. And so the adaptation resilience agenda was growing in Harare, and that was very opportune for us to be able to, um, to tap into that or to become involved in that. And we saw fractal and the Slara project working very much hand in hand to help support this climate change desk um, in Harare. And then in Durban, they have a strong adaptation history and culture in Durban as well. Um, and so for them, it was they had already started thinking about this idea of, of transfor transformative adaptation. How can we take it to scale? How can we take it across landscapes? And how can we involve lots of different people? And they had been thinking about that. And that's where it was, again, a very opportune moment for us to be able to um, initially sit with the, with the municipality and think about the kind of um, um, key uh, aspects to look at. And again, that has implications for how the, the, the process unfolded over time, because if we'd sat first with somebody working on the ground, I'm sure it would have been a very different process, but it has meant that the critical perspectives on adaptation that we try and bring from, um, you know, from academia has been integrated into their planning for this transformative river management program, which they are designing at the moment. Um, they're currently designing the, this, this program that I was speaking about just now. So we definitely look for those windows of opportunity and kind of design the work around that, but also trying to bring in the critical, um, the critical research perspective as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Um, and so time is, the clock is ticking and we're going to have to to move to our second presentation. There's an interesting question in the chat from Stephen, but we'll save it for the discussion, uh, the general discussion following uh, Timilade's presentation. Timilade uh, will give now her presentation on, on her project. As uh, Florina uh, mentioned earlier, she was part of the third cohort of the DERA project. Timilade, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thanks very much, um, Jill and everyone. Um, so our project um, is titled Cleaning from the Bottom Up, um, and it's about trying to improve the um, inclusivity of participation in integrated waste management in in Lagos, Nigeria, um, but also in Accra, Ghana. But I decided to, to focus on um, the work in Lagos just to, to sort of focus the discussion on the presentation today. Um, so here's the team, uh, me, I was the uh, PI, or yeah, I'm the PI on the project. And then I've got colleagues from um, um, University of Ghana, Cape Town, um, as well as, um, you know, civil society and practice. Um, so I, as the PI, I have, um, I'm a development sociologist. Um, so I've worked in, in a broad range of areas from energy to health, to agriculture um, um, and urban planning, um, you know, but the sort of common theme or common thread across these areas um, has been, um, you know, this focus on, on gender, you know, gender dimensions of, of, of the issues, as well as informality. Um, so in sort of considering this project, informality um, was a really strong theme, um, and it will be sort of apparent why, <laughs> you know, as we go on. Um, so yeah, just acknowledging the inputs of my colleagues here, um, and of course, Lira, the, the funder and the, and the sponsor. So uh, Lagos, um, it's the easily the biggest um, city, commercial center in um, not just West Africa, but um, all of Sub-Saharan Africa and even Africa as a whole. Um, and it's got this, um, it could use any number of characteristics to define, you know, to, to, or adjectives to describe it. Um, you know, but the ones that maybe relate the most to this, to this work, are, you know, like I said, the, the um, dimension of informality, um, the fact that it's complex, um, you know, dynamic, throw in all of these things and you have like this classic wicked problem um, that, uh, that 
TD research sort of tries to, to address, right? Um, so Lagos is heavily informal, more than 70% live in informal settlements. Um, nearly 90% work in the informal sector and the waste management um, sector is not an exception. Um, so there, there are like formal um, private arrangements, but they only cover like the tip of the ice, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And so um, a majority of, you know, no, no precise figures here because like almost by definition, you know, in, the informal sector is a bit um, hard to, to, to measure. Um, but, you know, informal uh, waste workers are really critical to um, waste collection and recycling. Um, and they're, they're mostly uh, community-based, um, you know, um, informal communities, both, both of um, the geography and of practice. Um, but the interesting thing is um, as crucial as they are to, you know, to the actual day-to-day -to -day practices of waste management in, in Lagos, um, they are mostly ignored um, or even worse, criminalized in, in, in formal waste management policies. Um, so, you know, our, our research project came in um, to try to see, you know, again, based on the assumption that bridging this um, sort of gaps between the formal and informal systems would lead to more um, inclusive, integrated, and therefore more sustainable waste management practices. Um, and you know that that would have uh, positive implications for um, all of these different um, sectors, um, all of these different SDGs. So um, this is taking um, this first uh, point is taken verbatim from the proposal that was submitted to Lira um, in 2018, um, and in the sort of parlance of TD research, you know, we're going for three three kinds of knowledge. Um, so the systems knowledge, the target knowledge, and the transformation knowledge. And those three bullet points correspond to um, each of those aspects of knowledge. Um, and those, those were precise questions. What was the current situation regarding risk management? Some of that was already um, known you know, to, to the research team from previous work, um, but this sort of afforded an opportunity to go deeper and further. Um, and then um, really what can be done, what, what's um, like practical, you know, so those are very practical, practice oriented in a sense, um, you know, uh, project. Is there a workable model um, for, for this kind of um, decentralized waste management that can secure the buying of key state actors? That's a very, very, very crucial point in the context of Lagos where um, the waste management sector as with a lot of other sectors is you know, highly politicized, highly um, political, you know, and, and therefore very sensitive. Um, and so if there is a workable model, how can it be actualized? Um, and, you know, the thing, the assumption again in thinking was if we could have this almost like microcosm of, um, um, of like a project or of evidence informed projects or interventions that work at community level, then we might be able to uh, like sell it to, you know, at city level, at, you know, policy maker level to, to then try to integrate that into, um, into formal policies. So, and this, this project ran from July, 2019 to September, 2021. Um, we're still, we're still uh, developing um, several outputs from that. Um, but just <laughs> reflecting on the time um, frames, it's like at the start of at the start of the period, you think, oh, you know, you, you've got two years to do this. But then it it, it gradually becomes um, clear that actually two years is a really um, short time in the in the broader scheme of things. And so you know, really asking um, in terms of especially when you're looking to to have um, um, you know this transformative. Um, impact and not just parachute in, do a project and go out, um, you know, so that the time frame I think is a key component of, you know, again, yes, there are constraints of um, funding, etc., etc., but maybe um, just trying to reflect and step back and say, maybe we need to be um, sort of clear about what um, a project like this can and cannot achieve given the time frame and um, and resourcing, as well as 
um, you know, the, the, the positionality of researchers, I, I think, um, not just in relation to um, communities, but especially in relation to um, broader power structures, um, you know, especially political structures, uh, you know, so th those are issues that um, I think throughout the research we sort of wrestled with and maybe um, found a, a little constraining, you know, if you will. Um, so th this is the, the composition of the project team. Um, I'm a sociologist. Um, I led the team and um, had a couple of um, environmental science focused um, um, team members. Um, but then again, the whole, um, the, the, the sort of fundamental shaping, I think, of the um, approach um, was heavily influenced by, uh, you know, social science, uh, sociological methods, um, and then linking up with different different actors from waste management, public policy. And very interestingly, I, I would say very um, most excitingly, I think for me, um, is the media advocacy aspect, uh, because for me, you know, as, as a traditional, you know, academic um, slash researcher, uh, you know, it sort of appended the way that I think about what constitutes um, valid knowledge one, and then how to how to push that knowledge out, or how to put it into the public domain, um, you know, for influence and change. So um, I'll just a little bit more, more detail um, about the project now, the in, the actual implementation of it. So this is a it's a dated map. It looks um, really old, but I couldn't get a better one. Sorry. Um, and here is um, Badia. This is the project community, um, you know, that we that we worked in. Badia is very, um, like even from this low res map, you know, it's clear that it's, uh, it's in a prime location. It's not far from, um, you know, waterfronts. It's, um, and, and it's smack in the middle of the city, um, you know, but, and so it's proximity to Lagos Island, which is the, Lagos Island, Victoria Island, which is like the commercial um, hub of Lagos is very, um, is, is it's it's a strong factor you know for the location um but what then you know the bad news is that that makes it um highly contested space you know hence so you know layering la layering um you know waste management on top of this history this sort of um, geography and history helps us understand um yeah you know the, the multi-layered um aspects and just how um just how complicated and complex, you know, um, it is. So underlying some of the um, waste management issues are issues of, um, you know, just who has a right to be here. So we have um, informal settlements, you know, all over, not just by here, but Ajiromi here and Apapa, um, you know, but you have the government, city authorities, continue, you know, continually um, trying to evict people, um, you know, from the, from the land so that they can then, yeah, have um, high high value, you know, in quote development and all of that. Um, so that that sort of context really really shapes the sorts of things um, that are possible, the sorts of strategies that are possible, especially regarding engagement with um, with um, city authorities and even sometimes municipal authorities. Yeah. So um, we went thing as a Lira team. Um, again, this is the the Lira report on the left, and um, I just wanted to um, frame, you know, the activities that we, we, we conducted in light of, you know, the three um, sort of phases of knowledge for production that are identified in the report. Um, so we were asked to do that. And, you know, th this diagram is just trying to um, underline the fact that you know, this is not a linear process. Um, so you have the joint framing of research agendas and then, you know, trying to co-design methods and then trying to um, sort of co-create policy options and then, you know, try to find ways forward. Um, so, you know, in practice, it's actually uh, not that easy to, to determine where one starts and where another stops, you know, but um, it's, it's still a useful way of, of at least maybe retroactively <laughs> sort of reflecting on um, what, what went on and what we can learn from that. 
So I'm just going to play, um, this is also an opportunity for me to catch my breath here. So I'm just going to play a like six minute video. Um, this was our first engagement with the community going in. Um, and, you know, for us, it, it really set the tone for what, what came afterwards. So I'm just going to play the video now. That was that. That was that. This very place, eh? It has been abandoned for over ten years. So this place is not really just been. But when the person is passing, drop one or two waste there. Other people see that waste there, other people start dumping waste there, both day and night. Hello, Joanna. Daughter. Kana. If you look at it, look at the canal. Look, look at it, it's a turn to a forest. People can pass through. This canal. This is our canal, just around the one. At least three times in a year, I'm a very dear. What the amount? This route will be a little bit easier because we not only do as at 你知道我都沒什麼愛心事情,我都在這個的這個的,我來我的班的project當我去。Especially but I think I am a young ก็สิบปากของที่อวัยนี่เฉยๆแล้วก็ยังต้องไปให้ครัวว่าเราได้ดีละทีนี้ก็ไปยาละไปได้มาบอกว่าอีเลยอ่ะวันก่อนที่
Mm. And we are not sensitized. We we'll still want government again the next two to three years. We'll come and clear it again, and clear it again, and again, again. To get our environment clean for Natal Labour, one of the solutions is to one, clean our elders. Happy and one, youths. Because they are vanguard. Because I want one now with one carbon to move on with one. How about if you want? Come back in this settlement, we're going to agree. Now, for the vanguard, we need to agree. Then, about two or three streets, I was a campaign like that. Then, the next step is to provide means where we will be drunk like that. Like okay? that, we'll turn back. Among ourselves, we're going to do it. I want to be a Kali volunteer. Okay, we're going to wear 1,000. 100 naira, 200 naira to buy this printing bag. Half in each house. The okay, you know, lay you. I want to make a name, daddy. That's into a man drop you. You know, you see you don't hear a good or read. Then you pay a good or you don't hear any talk about it. You don't hear any lay after you put that another step. That is step number three. The punishment that will follow. Whosoever that violates that, he let you about it. You don't have to say, and he can see what that will be. Okay, so um, just to highlight a few um, points around um, what came out of that exercise for us, um, that engagement, um, it was clear that, you know, going in the, the waste management issues that we identified actually um, were a very small part of a much larger picture. Um, it's interesting that the community is very knowledgeable about the problems and the potential solutions, but, um, you know, that sort of impetus, you know, um, to, to actually act on it um, requires facilitation at every stage, not just at the beginning, throughout. That was what we found at the pro um, project. Um, and then, you know, the pro progress required um, scaling back. For me, this was maybe the most um, um, a bit heartbreaking uh, because even though we, we certainly had this really clear picture um, of of the issues um, because of project resources and the remit, importantly, the remit of the of the um, project. Alice was Alice alluded to that in her in her presentation. The fact that um, you, know, you could only go this far and no further um, also maybe um, was a bit um, was 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 not uh, maybe the best outcome in that regard. Um, so, but on the back of on the back of that engagement, um, we then sort of went back as a research team to just present like a simple, um, you know, to analyze and to map out what, what we had, um, the data we had gathered, and, and so to try and have a, like a roadmap for the way forward. Um, and we sort of realized, okay, combining soft strategies with so-called, you know, quote unquote hard proposals, um, you know, might lead to infrastructure and services for waste management um, and that would um, address the you know the really important issue of that canal um, that was really important to the community um, so we, we, we were going to start with you know behavior change communication and you know uh, you know social sanitation type monitoring and all of that um, so we had this but what was interesting was that as, as we then um, went along uh, we found out that um, even that uh, map that resulted from the engagement, you know, sort of the co-produced um, vision, um, uh, we had to leave it open. Again, you know, we had to leave the interpretation open to the community. Um, and, you know, th there's a lot of behavior change um, communication literature that we had engaged with. And, you know, um, you know we we're going to start with um, just the soft, soft, um, soft campaigns. Um, but the, the community um, came back and said, oh, um, actually, they wanted to start with this cleanup exercise. Um, and so this is a picture from the actual cleanup day. Um, it, was, it wasn't um, the research team's sort of um, inclination to do that. Um, again, because, you know, um, I personally, you know, from a sociology background, I'm quite critical, you know, about maybe the, 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 the lasting impact maybe of such of such interventions um but then you know we sort of decided to be flexible about it again because of the you know given the td td um, focus of the work um and then turns out that actually it did a lot more than um than we we might have realized maybe not it maybe it didn't produce um you know the kind of 
outcomes that we would have foreseen or we could have foreseen. But what it did was it gave the community a sense of responsibility, some agency, um, some power, um, and importantly, a tangible benefit that they felt they could claim for their own, while also generating some important academic insights. Um, so critical here to, to the engagement and the outcomes was, you know, this element of co-production with civil society actors, which was really strong, um, you know, by this point in the project, um, you know, so we partnered with civil society organizations to to, to do the actual cleanup um, because they, tend, they are closer to the ground anyway. And even like, you know, during and after the cleanup to, to, to interpret the, the interactions and the, the insights coming up. And um, so it's one thing I, that I, you know, that I got quite a lot um, while, you know, on the project was, you know, things like, oh, you're thinking, you know, this is too academic, this is too academic, like, you know, break it down. Um, and that was really useful to be able to um, not just co-produce, but, you know, simplify and distill knowledge in a way that um, is easily translatable, you know, to the rest of the world. Um, so that was really key. Um, and then the last component, um, following on from the, the, the co, um, co-production of knowledge was then, okay, after we had done this um, almost flagship community play, um, cleanup exercise, um, which was, you know, great turnout, massive, it was well done. Um, we, then, we then thought, how can we institutionalize this? into policy, uh, not, not, not at the city level this time, but really just at the local government level. And then, you know, beyond the project, they could maybe scale that up. Um, and so we had um, a town hall meeting of sorts with officials um, at the local government, the environmental health officials, and you know, com um, traditional leaders, community representatives, um, uh, private sector um, actors, recycling, um, um, organizations and the idea was you know the linkages that we were able to um, form between community informal and the small formal actors for the cleanup exercise you know how do we institutionalize it and make it uh, make those linkages sustainable um, and so those those ways where you know, those paths paths to doing that were were actually identified um, in the course of the town hall meeting, it was very well received. Again, you know, the idea of facilitation was really, um, it was almost like once you started doing the facilitation, um, the pieces of the puzzle, you know, like almost fall into place. Um, so it was very um, sort of promising and, and very uh, exciting. Uh, but then the damper on that was, um, yeah, by then we had sort of reached the end of the project and then it was up to the, the public officials, especially to then follow through um, on, on uh, implementing, you know, this, this, um, this models, you know, of, for linkages that we had, that we had been able to show uh, it can work and did work, but then to do that on a sustainable basis. Um, but we didn't see that happen in the course of the project um, and then coming out, uh, you know, the, the research team sort of concluded that, you know, in, in the short term, at the very least, you know, the community may require um, some kind of incentivization, again, maybe topic for another for another proposal, to be able to self-mobilize for change, change that they actually um, believe in, but again, will require a bit of um, facilitation to, to take forward. Um, and then this, these are just final reflections on um, the just issues of, you know, positionality, expectations, and, and um, you know, the urgency versus, you know, long-term um, um, nature of actual change, uh, you know. And, yeah, so on the subject of positionality, this, this are, by the way, these are specific issues that we're asked to reflect on in this proposal, um, in, in this um, presentation. Um, so I'm just going to... Um, Talk about specific things that we did in response. This is by no means a you know a casual response, um, but what we did was actually motivated um, partly by COVID because um, during the lockdowns we couldn't go directly into the communities. So what we did was we delegated authority to this ten-person you know action committee. Um, you know almost as a matter of um, um, you know of it was was necessary of necessity. Um, but turns out that, you know, it achieved much more. It helped to build, uh, you know, mutual respect and trust. Um, but then I think at the end of the day, 
some issues which maybe we can talk about later i suspect will come up in <laughs> in uh, further discussion ultimately made us um, sort of realize that um, um we will we will we'll still always be outsiders almost you know to that to that um, community setting um which is not necessarily a bad thing as long as uh, you know we could have we can build lasting capacity so to speak um in the communities and the second point about managing expectations, um, you know, I will say just on a personal level that, you know, for me throughout, you know, and then reflections with the research team, um, you know, it presented this ethical dilemma that I'm not sure we ever uh, resolved um, fully, because we had to, we had to constantly and consistently sort of um, explain to the um, community and even sometimes to the municipality just the. The, the limits of our of this intervention, the limits of our project. You know, we are not here to build a new road. We are not here to, um, and these are valid concerns. These are valid um, expectations. You know, um, especially where you, know, you have resource constrained context. Um, but then again, you know, it's, it was impossible to cross that um, that line. Um, so what sometimes, just like the symbolic shows of good faith, might be things like. Um, you know, for committee meetings or something, um, there was always um, refreshments. <laughs> you know, just small, small gestures. Um, you know, even without asking or without making a condition of participation or anything. Um, so that's just a small example. I find that we had to do that um, throughout. Um, I'm still not sure. Uh, you know, that the community was 100% happy with the outcome. You know, with us, but um, yeah, which is why I said maybe not fully resolved. Um, and then the third point about, you know, the urgency of problems versus this long term, um, again, using the example of the cleanup exercise, almost like um, not as a marquee um, project, but, um, you know, in, in uh, upon reflection, you find that that kind of tangible activity, um, you know, it was a one day activity, but it was an activity that involves the whole community um, and they saw the outcome of it you know it, it, we actually did make a dent you know in the waste in the in the serious waste management problems that we had um so that that can provide um some proof of concept um you know as well as increase um you know public confidence and just okay so maybe this is possible you know after all if we um if we sort of work with with the broader structures um to to, to change things in the future um and that's it so if there are any questions um and in the discussion we can touch more deeply into some of the other points thank you thank you Demi Lale. and uh, yeah that video really added a powerful way of illustrating that waste management uh, issue in badia i see that uh Zena has a question in the chat do you want to take the mic and uh ask it Zena? Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for that presentation. And yes, I agree. The video was really something that brought the picture very clearly to us. Uh, the question really was that, you know, when you're looking at these initial uh, actions, the urgent actions, which help you build uh, confidence and also build community and stakeholder agency, uh, do you sometimes find that some of these actions become traps for longer term uh, and barriers for longer term pathways thinking. I mean, they would sort of consolidate a certain way of working uh, and certain kind of stakeholders. Uh, so local political sort of positions that might be taken and or, or was, and if not great, and if yes, how did you resolve them? Um, so I don't think, you know, those, in this case, those, if, a problem with locking in, you know, you know, if you like, like a particular model or mm -hmm. a particular activity. Um, so, you know, it was after the cleanup that we had the town hall that then sort of broadened the participation to different stakeholders. And the solutions, you know, there were, were actually not limited to what we did during the um, cleanup. Um, so, for instance, one major um, sort of step forward was okay um apart from actually cleaning up you know the the 
recycling or sort of aggregation of plastics and recyclables to then um, sell onward to recyclers um, was so that there was a stakeholder that came um, that works in that in that um, industry and then they, they, they talked about ways of linking um, communities again with possible incentives to do that um, there was no um, you know, it wasn't agreed exactly how that would be taken forward, but it opened up as a promising pathway, you know, if you like. Um, so, no, I think that the interest of the communities, especially themselves, is really the outcome at the end of the day. I think for them, the pathways to achieving that, um, they are happy to, to explore any number of different pathways okay. um, to achieving that. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for it. Another quick question, if anyone has, I see your hand is up. Alice, go ahead. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to um, as a presenter, but I was just, I was really interested in, you know, because the original perspectives of the people with whom you were working, you were saying that there was this um, idea that it was very much, the problem was very much a result of inadequate services um, from the government. And I was just wondering if through the engagements, I don't know how much different stakeholders were brought together, but whether that kind of finger pointing uh, decreased in any way, people sort of understood the, I mean, I know it is a problem, there's not, there's inadequate services, but the people understood sort of the systemic nature of the problem and the multiple drivers that result in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the waste piling up in a particular area, or whether it's stayed quite, um, I guess, polarized when you, it was what you often see in, in, in at a community level with government officials and then um, the community themselves. I was just wondering if there was any shifts in the sort of relationships or the way that they saw the problem. Um, that's a very interesting question, Alice. Um, because so we found ourselves, you know, as uh, the research team in the beginning, um, I was trying to draw people away from that narrative, from this polemic narratives that you're talking about. Uh, to say, okay, actually, yes, this may be the case that, you know, you have all these different people responsible who are not doing what they should be doing, but why not look inward and sort of focus on, you know, the bottom-up initiatives um, that you do have the capacity for, and then, you know, let us take that up to, to the higher levels as proof of concept. Um, but then again, reflecting on that um, critically later, we, 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 at some point, dropped you know that explicit sort of trying to to cause that shift uh because we didn't want to pre prescribe you know to you know preframe that whole narrative that way um i think that there was some kind of you know by the time we got to the end by the time we got to the town hall and all of that i think there was some kind of willingness on part of communities to then share some of the responsibility um, as opposed to just you know an us versus them thing and pointing fingers um, but that didn't come from maybe actively trying to dissipate that because we sort of caught ourselves trying to do that and but um, that's not being um, either neutral or you know engaging with it critically um, but by the end of the also again you know this cleanup exercise i think made people realize that uh, they, they could uh, make it a dent in it um, they were still aware um as as will be anybody that you know the changes are still the changes are still really beyond you know the scope of um, any one community to to actually make um especially if look at the issue of the canal which they identified as a really major issue um, but yeah, I think just in the in the way that the issues were uh, discussed and framed, they were willing to work more collaboratively with the with the government officials to identify um, concrete actions to do that. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong; I don't think that there should. I don't think that, that that the community should absorb any of that responsibility for for inadequate services, but. Um, yeah, I guess because waste plays such a prominent uh, role in the flood risk in Durban as well. So it's a big part of trying to deal with flood risk along with alien vegetation. But, you know, they're thinking about all the different actors, the private sector, what is their role in the, in, in the waste, you know, the, the production of waste and 
and then also yeah I guess communities have some role but then government at different scales so I was just wondering if there was any kind of replanning but I didn't wanted to be clear that I didn't think it should be absorbed the responsibility should be absorbed by the community yeah thank you uh so I would like now to kind of open up this discussion and perhaps even take a, a step back and reflecting of the implications of uh, knowledge co-production, transdisciplinarity, uh, pathways, um, kind of oriented approaches. Uh, and so for, for this, I kind of wanted to, to touch on something that um, you both alluded to in your presentations, uh, Alice and, and Temilade, which is the, the power relations and the, the power dynamics inherent to those um, transdisciplinary processes essentially and uh, and how researchers need to carefully uh, evaluate and navigate uh, those power dynamics uh, and this includes obviously your own position as researchers and my first questions um, that uh, I wanted to ask you was can you can you share with us some critical reflections and strategies that uh, you may have developed as a result of your experience uh, on this project or other projects Do you want to go first, Timonelli? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why not? Um, so I would say if, if I were to summarize this in, in one word, I would say, um, yeah, just humility, like the need to, to be humble, like literally to be humble. Um, sometimes as well, you think maybe you're humble, but you realize you're maybe you're not as humble. Uh, maybe for good reason, uh, you know, as a, as a researcher, as an academic, you, we have strong um, uh, theoretical positions, I would say, you know, on, on things, um, theories of change, um, things like that, uh, which are, you know, maybe well informed. Um, but then you go and engage with um, all these different stakeholders and, you know, find out that we had to really disabuse ourselves, you know, and almost hold, try to hold um, different, possibly competing beliefs in your mind at the same time, you know, and, you know, just realize that, um, you know, scientific knowledge is not the only valid form of knowledge. There are other knowledges um, in addition to values, beliefs, belief systems, and all of that, you know. So it's not a, just coming out of the fact that, you know, it's not, purely an academic exercise and we have at least as much to learn from all these other um, disciplines and uh, practices and um, you know world views and forms of knowledge um, as they they have to learn um, so it's never a it's a you know it's never done it's never finished it's a very dynamic sort of interaction back and forth um, and yeah, I think just adopting that mindset of um, humility and openness to co continuously be renewed in, in uh, thinking and approach um, was very um, something I learned in the process. Yeah, Alice, you want to go react to this? Yeah, I can add a few things. Um, and yeah, I think that the, the, the power dimensions of these processes is something that I've always been aware of and become increasingly interested in. Um, and, and actually it helps. So I think when we assume that we are undertaking these transdisciplinary processes, we assume that we are being more inclusive and assume that we, I guess we're being more ethical about producing knowledge that informs decisions. Um, but I think they can actually, if we're not if we're not careful to consider the power dynamics, they can actually be you know some damage that results from these kinds of processes. And for me, it was so. I think that the the, the process that we undertook in our particular liar project was very helpful to produce um, knowledge that influenced policy. We engaged a particular type, you know, this group of stakeholders, who, um, as I said, we 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 implemented interventions in English. We brought people together outside of their home spaces, but they were mostly sort of technician level and um, people working in the city and then civil society organizations who could engage in English and who grasped some of the, sort of the stuff that we were talking about, the concepts that we were talking about, which are quite rich concepts. Um, and so, 
so throughout the project, I assumed that it was something that was a kind of a more of an ethical process than might would might have normally happened in, in decisions that are being made in Durban. And then at the very end of the project, we were we were provided an opportunity to join forces across projects and to undertake another study. Um, and and I joined up with a colleague in Uganda, and we actually we decided to um, reflect on these processes. So it was from an academic perspective, but it was really really helpful for me. So we applied the framework of Fritz and Binder, who 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 show, they they present a framework of power and participation. And so they think about you know who's in, who's involved, who drives the agenda, and who drives the whole process. And for us, you know, we we very much drove the process. We brought we tried to bring a lot of people into the room, and that was quite that was somewhat exclusive because of the language and the types of activities that were implemented. Um, but we very much drove the process as a group of Western academics um, working in in contexts that that um, if we had more more time and resources and, and and thought more critically about the whole process you know there could be a lot of as I mentioned before many more learning activities that were done side by side to really be able to um, garner the insights of a lot of different people so for me that critical um, reflection at the end of the project to using a theoretical framework with another Tim and I spoke about sort of moving away from this the theoretical aspects of the work but for me it was really helpful to apply that theoretical framework to reflect on the process critically um, but now, you know, that, that's, that framework will be at the, the forefront of my mind when I think about going forward in, in transdisciplinary work. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot to be learned from that. And a lot, uh, yeah, I think a lot of mistakes that we did make that we can learn from and take forward in the other work that we do going forward. Thank you. I'd like to invite everyone to join this, this discussion. Uh, if you'd like to, to comment on what has been said, or if you'd like to share your own experience in, uh, in other transdisciplinary projects, uh, please uh, step forward and, uh, and share your, your perspective, your opinion. Or if you would like to discuss another, uh, another aspect of what has been presented by Alice and Kemilade. Yes, Olivier. Yes, hi everybody. Thank you for these nice presentations. Um, I am Olivier Dongle. I'm working at the IRD, the French Institute for Research and Development, and we have been working with several transdisciplinary projects in Africa and other continents. And I was wondering about the methodology. Um, I, I I just wonder if we really have a kind of a common framework to do this kind of analysis because we see that we have some common objective, common issues, common problems to try to face when we when we do this kind of transdisciplinary works. And I was wondering whether, um, for example, for one of my projects in South America, I'm using the theory of change framework. Uh, so basically we have this kind of uh, global objective towards uh, the one we go together. And then we have like uh, products and like uh, kind of co-working with the people and also evaluation about what we do and how it works and how it doesn't work. So uh, I maybe I I, I I am wrong, but I didn't hear this kind of um, framework like theory of change of pathways to change. And I was wondering whether these were the kind of framework that you used to or you were interested to, to use because they are kind of really used by many people. And I was wondering um, whether systemic science and transdisciplinary research need to have some kind of common, common tools and common methodology to try to be able to compare also among the different uh, study case or the different situation to, uh, to build a kind of common knowledge about this. So I, I wanted to have this, um, your, your opinion about the methodology framework that we may or may not wish to have uh, in common. Okay, I'm just gonna try and respond first again, Alice. Um, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think um, in the world of academia, there's a lot of um, literature, there's considerable literature around, you know, there's frameworks, methodologies, tools, and even in sort of conceiving of the project um, at all, um, or the, of the proposal, um, we were strongly guided and influenced, um, you know, by, by these frameworks and but almost like front and center is, you know, whatever you do, you're co-doing co it, you know. Um, and so that 
that, that then there's a lot of reflective pieces there you know to, to do that and so that that influenced our like framing of the of the problem but what i found was um or is that i think in td research like i think alice mentioned it in a, in her presentation this idea of going from paper to to reality is so it's almost like a uh, it's a bipolar thing almost uh, it's so different like you know by the time you sort of come out of those frameworks you you meet with the messy reality um, and so in sort of then analyzing the process and the data that comes out of that um, the idea is you know we're then able to maybe use it to refine to inform some of the frameworks that you know we started with so again it's still this sort of constant conversation but I, I would say maybe looking at the big picture you know you find these different elements in different places that are then linked together at the end but in my experience it's almost mind-bending to try and so when i'm engaging with communities i'm not thinking of a framework at that moment um you know or a civil society um just because it's almost like a schizophrenic thing <laughs> um you know um, but then all the, the sort of in analyzing the output from that you know we're then able to use it to inform um, frameworks and that's what then get written up into uh, the papers that add to the budget of literature around the, you know frameworks methods and, and tools thanks agar say you you want to react to this as well Thank you very much for the discussion so far. I just wanted to lend my voice to the discussion that is currently being made. My name is Arese Onagise. As Dr. Timilali said, I was on our research team. Um, thank you, Oliver. Yes, it's important to have frameworks, but I believe as researchers, we need to be flexible with the framework because when you get on the field, going straight into the community to see what um, is really implementable based on the framework or based on the guideline, you see that is a different story. So we had an opportunity to also liaise with the Ghana team and we're seeing common things or common trends that yes, we had a framework when we started out. A lot of things were changing as we we're going along and we had to be adapting to that change to ensure that we get the kind of results we're looking for. A typical example also was at that time, we also had the COVID um, pandemic. And then we couldn't go out as much as we wanted to, but we, need, we needed to be flexible to be able to constantly review, go back to the drawing board and see what will work based on the changes that were happening. So I just wanted to add my voice that as researchers, even if you have a research team, you need to be flexible and also look at the situation on ground and constantly change and adapt to the new changes that you're seeing. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Florina. Yes, I also like to add some words on this uh, question. Thanks, Olivier. Uh, first, uh, the theory of change, but then also the framework question in more general. In the LIRA program, we explicitly also worked with uh, theory of change uh, thinking. So we had a coaching activity, which we offered to all uh, grantees to systematically uh, think through their projects uh, and uh, really thinking what kind of theory of change might underlay uh, the different approaches that we have. So not so much in the sense of really like um, fleshing out linear uh, change models, but more to, to really think what actually, how do we believe that change might take place in our different contexts? And then also to use it later in the process to again go back and look um, uh, to reflect on the, the effectively uh, conducted um, activities and, and the implemented methods and to see if what has been assumed in the first place somehow became a reality or if it went out differently to learn from this for the future. And I, I, be, I believe personally this is a very valuable exercise because it helps us to learn from our own activity and, and experience and, and to become better in the future. And so I also believe that uh, frameworks must be um, applied very flexible as, as just has been said by, by the 
um, to speakers before me. And also, I think it, it, this is particularly true in in many southern countries where the context conditions are very uh, volatile and and, co and can change very rapidly and it and conditions can also be very difficult just to to do uh, field work um, and, and still uh, frameworks i think can help us a lot also to to improve the scientific quality or to and not to improve but to to maintain the scientific quality when doing research in these difficult contexts thank you florina alice uh, thank you for the question um so I'm going to answer very quickly and then I'm going to ask Olivia a question back if that's okay. So I, um, I, I, I worked in the world of development aid before I came back to research or academia working at UCT. And over those five years, I really, really came to hate theories of change because they were something that we just produced and they looked really good and the funders really liked the theory of change. And the problem was we never you know, like we designed the projects and then we passed them on to somebody. And I'm not sure how, how useful those theories of change were for people who were using, who, got, who had the project document that they had to work with. We did it in consultation, um, ticking all those boxes as one does. Um, but so, so, and only recently have I learned to love the theory of change because of applying it in the right way. And I think the most useful part of the theory of change is to explicitly, um, understand the assumptions of the change pathways, like to really, really, really interrogate those assumptions of the change pathways, but then to revisit those assumptions over and over and over and over again as a team, annually, every couple of months to look at what you've learned about those assumptions, because you're learning about the environment around you, but also about the change pathways. Um, and so I, I, I do, as, as Florina said, we had to develop a theory of change. We worked with with people to develop a theory of change at the beginning of the Lara project. And to be honest, I didn't, I didn't use this, this framework all that much during the, the process, but we had our team and we had one teammate who's also joined the call um, worked very in a very iterative way um, using this, this kind of change, the, the change theory or the goal um, that we had set out initially returning to that and thinking about it, what it meant for our methodology and thinking about what we'd, we'd learned over time. So, um, yeah, my question, I guess, is how, you know, how, how thoroughly do you engage with the, the theory of change or any change theory that you use? Um, and and, and is it the, do you also find that it's, like, it's about the assumptions that you write and that you interrogate on an ongoing basis that is probably one of the most useful parts of the theory of change? Yeah, thank you. That's that's a good question, and I had the same process than you. I hated uh, uh, theory of change at the beginning, and then I started to understand how they could be useful for my research too. Um, what is interesting with the it is the same um, um, situation than yours. It means that it was a funder that asked me to use the theory of change at the beginning, and I was like, I don't want to do this. I just want to to keep on the way I'm doing. But I was interesting because uh, the funder had different project funded, and it was great to be able to come compare the different situation because you sometimes you just feel and other researchers feel this also that every study case is a different study case and so we don't find any like common thread and common um, discussions among the different projects and this is something that academics want to have too they want to have the broader issue and to try to to share some kind of common common mechanisms or stuff like this or to put some kind of categories so so the theory of change was really appealing for this at the beginning and, and we we're still doing this and I, and as you said i think that the most important um um benefits of the theory of change for me is to go into the details between what i'm doing and what would be the impact this is really the stuff stuff for for the investigator i think because for decades we were like doing science doing research and saying okay in some way it's going to do some development or it's going to help for pe people and so there was this kind of magic uh, magic stuff between science and and development and i think the theory of change is really good to try to okay but how is this? How, how are you sure it's going to do this? Try to do the implementation or the evaluation of this, that, that it is correct. And this is something that is not very easy to do because sometimes, and most of the time, you just realize that you're not really providing the kind of knowledge that is really needed to do a change. And you, and, and you come to, to realize that you needed another 
viable uh, as it was said in the in the in the project about um, about um, the the management of the waste you know, we need other part of the picture to understand what was the waste management issue and this is the same thing in many projects so i think this is really what i value in the theory of change to be able to to have a framework that that push you that pushes you into the really the hard stuff about the link between something that you improve the kind of knowledge that you co-build and then the change of the, the implementation of this knowledge so Yes, I think there are other other frameworks, but maybe this one can be also interesting. Yes. Thank you very much for for this question and for the very rich discussion that ensued. Any other comments on this or another topic that you'd like to bring up? There was a question earlier from uh, from Stephen that I think uh, would be interesting and could relate, obviously, to to both projects uh, that were presented today, and it had to do with uh, engaging how to engage um, stakeholders that do not themselves, uh, well, who have not previously been recognized or encouraged to think of themselves as stakeholders, how to bring them into a such co-design or co-production process to begin with. Uh, Stephen, maybe you, you want to, to add to or re reformulate the question uh, up to you. Uh, thanks. Now, I, I'm, uh, I, don't, I think that's more or less the, the main issue. I mean, uh, um, my experience has been that it's very hard sometimes to have um, sort of satisfying co-production when um, stakeholders have not been already part of the process from the co-design co stage. And so um, I'm curious to know how the presenters today have um, addressed this in their own projects um, about how um, uh, to bring in excluded stakeholders or stakeholders who may never because um, because um, they haven't felt encouraged to do that. So any reflections you may have on that subject, I, I, I... Alice, you can start if you're ready. I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna, again, I don't think I'm gonna give Stephen a good um, or satisfactory answer to your question, because I don't think, I don't think we, you know, in an ideal world, you would invite everybody who um, is, it will be affected by that decision to be a part of the process from the very beginning. But then there's also this, and we didn't do that um, for in our project. You know, we had a we had a, a proposal writing stage, and we didn't engage every stakeholder that became a part of the process a bit later at the proposal writing stage, because um, it would just it would it, we didn't have the, the the time and the contacts at that stage to be able to do that. Um, as I said, in an ideal world, that would that would be great. The other problem is this tension between um, in, in managing. You know, Tim Lardy spoke about managing expectations, but also, in some, in a sense, wasting people's time sometimes if something doesn't materialize. So, if you're writing a proposal and you engage everybody extensively about the potential of being part of this change process over time, and this happens a lot with um, a lot of people in these contexts. You know, they are constantly. Um, constantly being engaged to be a part of a process or for extractive research to understand the systemic problems a bit better. Um, then, you know, then there's this tension of when, when, when is it safe to say that this is going to go, go ahead and then we can bring everybody on the same page. But, and then we didn't do that at the pr proposal writing stage because we didn't want to, um, we didn't want to set up for the reasons that I've, I've already mentioned, but also because it's hard to set up that expectation or waste people's time if it doesn't come to fruition. I'm not saying that's the right way. I'm just saying it's a tension that we also sort of, that we experienced in our project. And I'm not sure what the right way is to go about it. Maybe Tim Adade has more, more ideas on that. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't give you a right way either. Um, but I think just to add um, a couple of thoughts. Um, so, you know, going in, um, you know, I think just like Alice mentioned earlier, um, we had prior engagement um, in another context with this community. And so um, we understood that they considered, waste management was something they considered to be a priority issue for them. Um, 
So this project was like really to dig deeper into something that came out of another project. Um, so just starting from the, the, the baseline of something that was, at least in theory, um, they had expressed was important to them, I felt uh, almost makes it, you know, everyone at that community level at least, um, and, and even at the municipality level, to, to feel like, you know, they, even if they don't think in those terms or use that word, they feel like they, they have an interest in getting waste management issues addressed in their community. So there was that, you know, on that sort of psychological level, I don't think there was too, too much resistance um, on that front. Um, however, one subgroup that we had, um, that we had to deliberately pull in um, was women. Um, so we had, again, deliberately separate engagements with, um, with men, women, and, um, and young people. Um, but even in sort of following up on the um, you know, action points and all of that, women were easily the sort of, I wouldn't say resistant, but, you know, it, you know in Stevens were difficult to see them. So you, you could see that maybe they didn't see themselves as, um, maybe they, they, they saw themselves as, as stakeholders, but they didn't feel that they had the agency or enough agency to then proceed um, you know, to, to, to go further in terms of defining solutions and things like that. Um, so what we just tried to do was persist, you know, persist in, um, in the invitations in the, so sometimes like we had to go in advance personally to, um, invite them by, by this time we had built, um, relationships, maybe it also helped that the research team, um, was, I don't know, 60, 70% female. So, you know, in a sense, um, and it turns out that that group or that subgroup is very critical to waste management because they are the ones who actually do waste management um, at the community level and at the household level. Um, so yeah, the, the element of wasting um, their time potentially very, 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 very valid. Um, also because women have the greatest incidence of time poverty. Um, and so, yeah, we sort of limited it, but we tried to deliberately but because if we didn't do that and we called general consultation whatever stakeholder meetings town halls they will just never show up like and that's not it's not a, an exaggeration to say that so we like deliberately reached out to to engage them thank you um alice brought uh sydney's question to my attention sydney would you like to share this question with uh with everyone Otherwise, I'll read it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of summarize it myself. Um, so it, it, it relates to mistakes that are potentially made during the process of uh, co-design, co-creation, and the kind of uh, uh, the assumption or inclination uh, towards the fact that the researcher is obliged to do no harm, uh, a bit like, like a doctor. Um, but taking into account the fact that sometimes mistakes might be an opportunity to build stronger relationships of trust and uh, mutual vulnerability. Um, would you like to comment on this, uh, Timilade or Alice? Yeah, I can, I can just go first quickly. Uh, yes, I saw that question earlier and I was meaning to answer it if there was time. Um, yes, we did, we did make uh, mistakes. And one key one um, was, um, yeah, in trying to um, engage um, the community from it from a relative distance especially during covid um turns out that in the prior to the cleanup exercise turns out that um we hadn't engaged as broad a section of the community as we should have the, or as broad a section as we should have known to you know it's one thing you know we didn't even realize and, and it's really so the point earlier about you know the community being ultimately unknowable um but then we have to try, we have to keep trying, right? Um, so I sort of, you know, we came away with this lesson that, you know, in, in this kind of T TDR work, you know, broadening participation is, you know, just as important as deepening it, you know? So we talk about deep participation, you know, making it go beyond just, um, I don't know, consultations or asking questions, but, you know, the sort of breadth of those who are involved in, in that, um, also matters a lot. Um, and maybe there has to be a balance. Maybe when you do that, maybe you're not able to go as deep with maybe like this smallish, um, um, you know, subset that maybe you could have, 
but you know, for for long term outcomes for trust, because what then happened was on the morning of the cleanup, and this is just an anecdote. For like two hours, you know, there was the, there was this almost fight that broke out in the community between those who were the in crowd, who felt they were who were the in crowd, and those who felt they had been deliberately sidelined by this um, engagement um, process, even though the committee that was set up was supposed to be representative of the entire community. It turns out that, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, so really trying to avoid that and to, yeah, w- without being seen to be partial to either, to any sort of group of so subset of stakeholders. Um, it's, it's more difficult than it might sound um, to do, because again, you know, you're always coming, you know, seen from the outside in, um and i mean what can i say it's just you know you have to keep learning i think one thing i will say in in conclusion is that um going back to this community was also a deliberate decision for the research team because we felt like it was there was more value potentially in staying with the community and sort of learning and growing with them than sort of to keep going around communities so it's something that we have learned and then maybe about that specific to that community. And now we now know more of the you know, actors and things. And then in subsequent projects, you know, we can avoid that specific uh, mistake within that context. Yes, we can apply the lessons to other contexts, but you know, we've gained a lot of traction you know, on, in this specific context. And so, yeah, we're able to apply it on a, a future project together. Thank you very much, Pini Lade, for this. Um, the being mindful of, of time, I can see that the session is, is almost over. So unfortunately, we're going to have to to leave it there for today. But thank you again uh, very much to, to all of you, to Florina for introducing the, the Lira program to us at the start of the session, to Alice uh, Timilade for sharing their experience and insights on knowledge co-production and, and pathways research, to all of you who participated uh, by contributing to this stimulating discussion and to the Pathways Initiative team for making sure that this event ran smoothly. It has been an absolute pleasure to be part of this event and I would like to remind you before we close um, that the Pathways Cafe um, is a bi-monthly event that happens between each Pathways Forum it's a casual social event for everyone who is part of the Pathways community to further uh, discuss uh, things that were initiated during the Pathways Forum. So we'll be able to pick up uh, the discussion on that occasion. You can also bring up other topics of discussion and it's also a great opportunity to get to know other members of the Pathways uh, community through a much more informal format. Our first Pathways Cafe took place in December and led to some very uh, interesting discussions. Uh, Natalie has shared a link to uh, in the chat to register for the next Pathways Cafe that will take place uh, on February 25th. So we hope to see many of you there. Uh, also, I'd like to remind you that if you have not subscribed to our newsletter or Twitter account, I encourage you to do so so that you receive news updates uh, and opportunities related to pathways and transdisciplinary research. Uh, and again, Natalie has probably uh, given you links in the chat to subscribe to those things. Lastly, if you would like to watch the recording of this session, uh, we'll make it available on, on our website. Uh, so you can visit the Pathways Forum webpage for this. Before we conclude, as we usually do, I would like to invite you all to take a minute to write in the chat one thing about the Pathways Forum that you would like to improve or that could be improved, and a topic that you think deserves to be addressed in a future Pathways Forum. Thanks again, everyone. I look forward to seeing you at the next Pathways Forum. And in the meantime, take care. <laughs>